1040, 1040 actually, as we look at verses, no, 1041, as we look at verses 45 to 48. Only three verses today, but powerful verses. So read along with me. Luke 19, verses 45 to 48. Then he, this is Jesus, our Lord, Jesus entered the temple area and began driving out those who were selling. It is written, he said to them, my house will be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. Every day he was teaching at the temple. But the chief priest, the teachers of the law, and the leaders among the people were trying to kill him. Yet, they could not find any way to do it because all the people hung on his words. Amen? This is a simple story. By the way, I, I know I'm not going to get to it, but perhaps when we look at the other Gospels, and we'll look at them also, but... There is such a thing as righteous anger, and we see that from Jesus Christ. Does that mean we have a right to be so angry and turn tables as Jesus did? I think we have to be careful that it's righteous anger, and this is our Lord God who is always right. So be careful in your anger. But there is righteous anger. Now, this simple story is so important to God that he describes it describes it in the other Gospels. All four Gospels has this story. So let's take a look at the other Gospels regarding this event. Let's start with the first book of the New Testament, Matthew. And we will find the story in Matthew 21. And it's on page 978. Matthew 21, verses 12 to 13. We read, Jesus entered the temple area and drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. It is written, he said to them, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. And then in the Gospel of Mark, Mark 11, verses 15 to 18, we look at that on page uh, 1003. Mark 11, verses 15 to 18, we read, On reaching Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple area and began driving out those who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves and would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple courts. And as he taught them, he said, it is, Is it not written, my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. But you have made it a den of robbers. The chief priests and the teachers of the law heard this and began looking for a way to kill him, for they feared him, because the whole crowd was amazed at his teaching. And then finally, in the Gospel of John, it's actually at the very beginning, uh, we see in John chapter 2, Verses 13 to 17 on page 1051, we read, When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple courts, he found men selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and others sitting at the tables exchanging money. So he made a whip out of cords and drove all of them from the temple area. Both sheep and cattle, he scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. To those who sold doves, he said, get these out of here. How dare you turn my father's house into a market? His disciples remembered that it is written, zeal for your house will consume me. These are the words of God to you and me today. Amen. Let us learn from it. To better understand the, the, the story, the passage, let us note a few things. First of all, Jesus goes to the holy city of Jerusalem, and that's where the temple was at that time 2,000 years ago. What is this temple? 
Today, there is a remnant of this temple. That's all that's left. The only thing that's left, if I can show the picture, is this wall, the western wall. The rest of the temple is gone. But the western wall, they call it the wailing wall because it is part of God's building. And it's the only thing left, so they, they go there. You can go there and cry and touch. The temple Jesus entered to is real. It exists even today. You can go to Israel and touch the temple that Jesus entered into. The Bible is factual history. It is real. Let's make a note of that. The Bible does not lie. It is history and it is truth. Now what happened to that temple then? You see, Jesus even predicted it. As he was looking at the temple, he said, this building will be destroyed. The temple was destroyed by the Romans in the year A.D. 70. About 2,000 years ago, the Romans decided to burn the whole city, and uh, we see destruction of the city, and that temple was destroyed, as predicted by Jesus, and the only thing that exists now is that wall. What did that temple look like before it was destroyed? Well, before it was destroyed, the temple during Jesus' time looked like the original temple that was built by King Solomon. King David wanted to build a temple for God as he was relating with God, as his people was chosen, as they were relating to God. David wanted to build this temple but God says, no, you have made a big sin. Although you love me, I'm going to give this honor to your son, Solomon. And God instructed, in, uh, we read it in, uh, in the Old Testament, in 1 Kings, that God instructed King Solomon to build a temple. That, that, but that original temple was destroyed also by the Babylonians. Fascinating history of the temple and the Jewish people because they kept sinning even though God was with them. But they needed the temple, as we'll note later, but because of their sins, the Babylonians took over just like the Romans took over 2,000 years ago. Uh, in 587 B.C., the Babylonians came to Jerusalem, destroyed everything, including the temple. Now, the temple which Jesus entered to uh, 2,000 years ago, was rebuilt in 516 B.C. under the direction of Nehemiah, if you want to look at those stories, and other prophets of God. Now, King Herod also did some modification to that um, temple that was rebuilt in 516 B.C., and therefore uh, many scholars and people will call that temple during Jesus' time Herod's Temple. But let's, let's get into the purpose of that temple, as I alluded to. What was the purpose of the temple? God, in the Old Testament, related with people who were sinners. And God, in the Old Testament, required uh, his people to bring animals to be sacrificed at this temple. Why? So that their sins can be forgiven. It was an atonement. The sacrifice of the blood of animals was put into that temple. By the way, we know the Lord Jesus is going to be coming soon because you know the Bible tells us that that temple will be rebuilt again. And you know what's happening? There are priests being trained in how to do animal <coughs> sacrifices again. And, and several years ago, they, it, we couldn't even think about that that temple being rebuilt, and the priests coming in because they were looking for this red heifer that God insists that is needed for the sacrificial uh, atonement, guess what? They found the red heifer several years back. Everything is being lined up for the rebuilding of the temple for the end to come. Uh, the purpose, again, was animal sacrifices were, were, were done 
for the sins of God's people. That was the reason uh, for the temple. This is why we read animals were near the temple. The animals were needed for the sacrifices required by God for cleansing his people's sins. The temple was built as the place for sinful men to what? To connect again with God. That was the purpose of the temple, to connect again with God. But note, before the death of Jesus. As we'll note in the future, in this temple, there is this curtain, the Holy of Holies, where God would meet the, whole, the, the one priest. When Jesus died, that curtain tore in half miraculously. It just tore in half. God tore it like a piece of paper. And what God was saying, when Jesus died, there's no longer need for this temple and this separation because now we can connect with God through Jesus Christ. Isn't that amazing? Incredible stuff. How can man just say these are just stories of people when everything lines up and makes sense and God performs this miracles Miracles for us to observe. So the temple was built as the place for sinful man to connect with God before the death of Jesus Christ. I'll touch on that a little bit later. But then Jesus comes to this temple and he says, it's my house. Why did he call it my house? We noted in the Gospel of John, Jesus called the temple as my father's house. My Father's house. God the Father and me are one. It is our house. This temple of God is my house. Jesus and God the Father are one. And the Holy Spirit along with them are one. That's what God tells us. Three persons, but one, God. So that's what Jesus was saying as he was saying, it's my house. Now, just Jesus found people selling in the temple courts. They're selling. They're making money. You see, the, de the temple was divided into specific areas of use. And uh, I think I have a picture right here of, of how that temple looked like. And you can see that the, uh, the, the surrounding uh, open areas are the courts and the holy buildings were in, in the middle. The temple courts is where people gathered to meet and prepare for the sacrifices. The temple court surrounded those holy places in the temple. What were they selling in the temple courts? As we noted in the passages, animals, doves and sheep and cattle were being sold in the temple courts. And then we note that there were money changers. So they were selling and then there were people exchanging money. You see, the Jewish religion again, required animal sacrifices in that temple. So animals were sold and people made a business out of it. That's what happened. The old Jewish religion required animal sacrifices and so animals were sold and many people made a business out of it. People were making a profit because of religion. And Jesus comes along. He got so mad. Get these out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a market. You're bringing religion as an excuse to make money. And God is, can be righteously angry with that situation. We'll touch on that a little bit more later. And Jesus said, the temple is to be a house of prayer, not a marketplace. Let me just touch on this. What is prayer? Prayer, of course, is talking with God, right? But let me expound on that. You see, in general, prayer is connecting with God. I, 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 I've shared this before. I kind of like the, the picture for us today. It's like a, a power cord connecting to heaven as we pray so we can be empowered by God. 
If you're not praying, you're unhooked. This projector here, I can just unplug that and that's out. Prayer is like that, connecting for the power of God. Prayer is connecting with God. And again, that was the purpose of the temple, to connect with God. That's why Jesus said, it's a house of prayer to connect with me, not a marketplace. And so we note in verse 47 that, that, that Jesus not only said that, but he taught every day at that temple to connect with his people, with sinful man. You see, may I suggest this? Connecting with God, prayer, is not just talking to God. It's about also making offerings to God. That's what they did, but it's an offering to God. But we also note that it is about being taught by God. That's how we connect with God. We talk to Him. We make offerings to Him. But then we listen and be taught. It's a two-way street. God wants to fellowship with us. That's the power of prayer. But let's note, there were people who hated Jesus. Why? Because Jesus was changing the, the situation that was dishonest, and Jesus was turning people to truth. You ever get people angry because you're telling them the truth? You, you, you try to tell them that, that God is a holy God, that there is a God, and they will be so mad. That's what was happening. Jesus was sharing the truth for dishonesty, and therefore people hated Jesus. Not only that, they wanted to go ahead and get rid of him and kill him. And who were those people? The leaders of this religion, because Jesus was changing things. They did not realize. That's why Jesus wept. That's why we noted that in a couple of verses back. Jesus wept because they didn't realize that Jesus is taking care of business once and for all. No more need for the temple. There will be a direct connection relationship with God through Jesus Christ. But they were missing the point. And so they hated Jesus and they wanted to kill him. But we note they could not kill him. Why? What's the note? What do we read? I'm sorry? People hung around Jesus, but also specifically, what do we read? They hung on to every word of Jesus. To me, I, I found that very significant. They could not kill Jesus when people hang on to Jesus' words there is no way to kill him. We'll apply that in our notes. But let's make a note of the first one. Three major biblical principles for us in this passage. Simple, but yet I believe profound. And I hope you really think about it and pray about it. First of all, uh, I have in your notes, making profit and connecting with God cannot mix. But perhaps we need to uh, make that more specific, that making selfish profit, making selfish profit and connecting with God cannot mix. You see, we must always be careful of making money for ourselves because of our church. We must be careful of making money for ourselves because of our religion and our church. We talk about membership and coming together. That can be abused. Let me give you an example. Um, Elsa and I became a member of this one particular church. A few days later, we get this call. Ah, oh, I heard you just became members. Uh, that's great. Congratulations. Yes, thank you. Um, you know, and what's the reason for the call? Well, you know, have you thought about your life insurance and your insurance needs? This guy was trying to sell something to me because we became members of a church. I think that's wrong. I think Jesus calls it wrong. 
We need to, to be careful, be warned of using God's church for selfish gains. Uh, you know, one of these days I'll put together again a directory. We have new people and we'll take pictures. We'll have a church directory. So we'll have addresses and phone numbers, perhaps even email. You know, we could easily abuse that. Be careful. I, I said making selfish profit and connecting with God cannot mix because it does not mean you should not bring up your business or your work to the Lord. Because everything that we do is to be for the Lord. It's just not to be for selfish gain and taking advantage of people being part of that. Okay, I hope that's clear to you. That making selfish profit and connecting with God through our faith, God will get mad. Secondly, again, God's temple is for connecting with God, not for selfish prophets. So the temple in Jerusalem wa was destroyed as ordained by God. So God's temple is for connecting with God, that temple, not for selfish prophets, but that temple, the only thing left is a wall. It was destroyed A.D. 70. So we don't have a temple anymore to connect with God. Let me ask this question. What is God's temple today because of Jesus Christ? Pardon me? Your head. As a believer, we read that in scriptures. Our hearts, our being is a temple for the Lord. And as we gather as a church, we are also a temple of the Lord through Jesus Christ. God's temple today is not a building. It is about the spiritual family that we have and the Christian believer itself. That is the temple of God today is you and I as a church and you and I as individuals. You follow that? And God's temple is for connecting with God. And God's temple is what? It's to be a house of prayer, connecting with God. What are the three things we noted from this passage about connecting with God? What are the three things about connecting with God? What do we do when we pray? We talk to God. What's the second thing? We offer to God, and then we are to be taught by God. So you and I are God's temple. The church is God's temple, and we are to be a house of prayer, a way to connect with God. A house of prayer is about talking to God, offering to God, and being taught by Jesus. So personally, how are you doing in connecting with God? How are we doing as a church? You know, if, if someone tells you about their church and they're so excited, may I encourage you to do this? In prayer, of course, sends the Holy Spirit. But ask them, is it a house of prayer? Is it really a place where people, sinful people, are connecting with God through prayer, through offering, through the teachings of Jesus Christ. Because if it's not, honestly, many churches today are just entertaining and pray that we don't become one. We are to be a house of prayer. That's what Jesus is looking for for you and me. We are to do that as a church. We are to do that as individual Christians. And finally, let me ask this question. What would happen if no one believes in the two New Testament Bible anymore? What will happen if nobody believes in the words 
that are in the New Testament about Jesus Christ, what would happen? Yes, we'd be lost. What else? I'm looking something in general, and it's connected with scriptures. What will happen if, if no one believes in the New Testament anymore, Delph? Christ would be gone. Think about that. Christianity, true Christianity, would be dead if no one believed in these precious words of God, the precious words of Jesus Christ. That's what Jesus said. That's what we read. They could not kill him because people hung on to his word. I think that's so powerful for us today. We are to hang on to the words of Christ and bring it to the world because if we don't, Christianity might as well be non-existent and dead. Do you and I truly personally realize the importance of hanging on to Jesus' words on a daily basis? Would you take a moment right now just to pray about these things? Make a commitment. Ask Jesus to help you in what you need to do to honor and glorify him and to continue the beauty, the love, and the life of Jesus Christ through you and this church.